When we're dealing with data, and we have a number of columns and rows, we're going to define this matrix X as all of the rows and columns in the data set. So therefore, X as a matrix is going to be each X I sub J, where I is the number of rows, J is the columns. And this is known as a random matrix if, if each XJ is a random variable. Now the mean of that particular random matrix X is going to yield a vector. So in other words, E of X is going to be equal to the expected value of each variable in our matrix. So if we have 10 variables in our random matrix X, we will have a vector of 10 means. Each column gets averaged, and that would yield us a vector, and that we would call the mean vector of the matrix. So some interesting properties of the expected value are, if we add the expected value of two matrices, x plus y, it's going to be equal to the expected value of x plus the expected value of y. If we multiply by constants, we can remove out the expected value of x because, again, a a times x times b, if a and b are constants, would basically not affect the average itself if we have calculated the average or the expected value of x. So therefore, e a x b is going to be equal to a times the expected value of the random matrix x times b. And this generalizes a scalar property of e times cx is the same as c, which is that constant, times the expected value of x. So here's an example of data. Each column represents the collected data and can be considered a random variable. Thus, we'll call our data set X. Here we have film titles, released, studio, worldwide gross, and so forth. Now we may not use all of these in our analysis because we may not use studio or we may not use the film title, but this is what our data set looks like and it forms a matrix X. So the matrix X, N by P, has P columns and N rows. Each column will have a mean, and thus there would be p means. We call this the vector of means, and it can be represented as e of x. Mu equals e of x equals each one of the particular expected values or the means of each variable. And so therefore it's mu of x1, mu of x2, and so forth. Now a variance-covariance matrix is a covariance matrix of the random matrix and basically is a matrix of pairwise covariances. So in other words, for each pair of columns, we're going to compute a covariance. And on the diagonal, we would end up with the variable's covariance with itself, which, we'll know, which we know as the variance. So therefore, the covariance of two variables is listed as the co covariance of x, y. And so therefore, our covariance matrix will be denoted by a sigma. So sigma is the covariance matrix of our data. Now this is what it looks like when we have the pairwise covariances. Sigma is equal to the covariances of each one of the variables with each other. So if I have three columns of data, I will end up with a three by three covariance matrix. But note that the covariances on the diagonals are actually the variances of the random variable. So therefore the diagonals change slightly. The diagonal becomes the variance of each one of the variables. From the covariance matrix, we can actually get a correlation matrix. Many of you will already be familiar with the correlation matrix. And again, if we take the correlation of each one of the pairwise co covariances, if we take the correlation between each one of the variables, we'll notice that again on the diagonal, we will end up with the correlation of the variable in itself, which we know to be 1. So therefore, the diagonals are 1 everything else will be the correlation between the pairwise variables. Now the standard deviation matrix is a matrix of the standard deviations and we denote this as v to the one half. So therefore remember that the standard deviation of a single variable is just the square root of the variance. In our standard deviation matrix v to the one half we will have all of the entries to be zero except the diagonals and the diagonal will be the square root of the individual variances. And this gives us our matrix of the standard deviation. Once we have this, we now can compute and understand the relationship between the correlation matrix and the covariance matrix. So here, 
we can compute the matrices given the fact that we have either a covariance or a correlation. So if we have the correlation matrix, we can compute the covariance by multiplying it, that correlation matrix, by the standard deviation matrix in front and at the end. If we have a covariance matrix, we can multiply it by the inverse of the standard deviation matrix, both again in the front and in the back. So the generalized variance of a random matrix is the determinant of its covariance matrix. We refer to mu, sigma, and rho as a population mean vector, population covariance matrix, and the population correlation matrix, respectively. Here's an example, and this is computed out completely. Here's our formula for the correlation matrix, and here's our formula for the covariance matrix. We're given a covariance matrix of 504, 360, 180, 360, 360, 0, 180, 0, and 720. We could compute our standard deviation matrix by zeroing all the entries except the diagonals and taking the square root of the diagonals of the covariance matrix. We can then compute an inverse, and we would use the solve function inside of R to do that. Then we will multiply the inverse standard deviation matrix by the covariance matrix by the inverse of the standard deviation matrix to obtain the correlation matrix, which we'll see here. One thing to note is that if we're going from a covariance matrix to a correlation matrix, we should find that the diagonals are 1 and that all of the other entries are between negative 1 and positive 1. 